All right, cool. Um, so who am I? I'm, first off, I'm not an AI expert. So today we are talking about um, designing experiences that utilize AI, but I'm by no means an, an AI guy. Um, I just think it's interesting and, and I've learned some things designing around AI. Um, barely a UX expert, I would say. I've been doing this for maybe five or six years. And um, I'm a tinkerer. I love to design uh, games. I, I enjoy um, music and just kind of have a lot of hobbies. Probably like many of you, too many hobbies. Um, and another thing about me is I'm a new dad. So this is Artie. His Hawaiian shirt day was yesterday, so I had to get a picture. Um, so, kind of get out of the way a little more. All right, so where do I work? Uh, Dave talked a little bit about Chatbooks. Um, I work primarily on the iOS app, which is our, our main product at Chatbooks. And our goal is to be the, the easiest uh, mobile fo photo book creation and, and greeting card creation tool. Um, and you've probably, if you do know about us, you've probably seen our, our viral ad, which is the real mom video with, with her. So if you haven't, definitely check it out. It's, it's a good one. Um, and real quick, uh, just to go over what AI is, um, for anyone that, that might not know, um, it stands for artificial intelligence, and it's defined as the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. So um, that also includes terms that you've probably heard thrown around. These are all under the blanket of AI, machine learning, neural networks, deep learning. Um, and typically, uh, just to, to talk about kind of um, where we are in the world in regards to AI, AI and kind of um, where we come from. So since the days of like John Henry versus the steam drilling machine, there's been an apprehension about this man versus machines dilemma. Um, and it's often framed as a contest, like one or the other is better, one's going to win, one's going to lose. Um, and even in the story of John Henry, he, he beats the machine, but then he dies. So it's like, who wins? I don't know. Uh, but let's look at a few more like recent examples. So this is 1997. Um, this guy who is th either thinking really hard or very sad is Gary Kasparov. Uh, and he went up against a supercomputer by IBM called Deep Blue, and he lost. Um, it's the first time a computer beat a human at chess. Uh, so that's one for the computers. Um, 2011, Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter went against IBM's newer computer, uh, Watson, at Jeopardy, and they lost. Both of them had like, let's see, Jennings had about 5,000, Rutter had 10,000, and Watson had $35,000 at the end of the game. So pretty handily beat again by the computers. Um, <clears throat> and then in 2016, um, you probably heard of this. Google made something called AlphaGo that beat Lee Sedol in, and he was the, the world champion in Go. Um, this is a game that was thought too complex because there were so many possible moves for a computer to compete at. But using um, neural networks trained on like 30 million games or something, they were able to, to beat him. So yeah, so three to zero, it's not looking that great for humans, right? And that's kind of the story I think that we're told a lot is like, um, things are bad for humans. We hear like, uh, robots are going to take your jobs, AI will make your profession obsolete, um, or machines are gonna kill us all. Like, that's, that's the headlines um, that we see. Um, but my question is, uh, is it really a competition, or if it is, does it have to be? <clears throat> so my, my personal opinion, and I'm kind of an optimist, because there are AI pessimists and optimists, is that AI never will replace people because of something I call the human factor. Um, besides being a really cool band name, if anyone wants to use that, uh, the human factor is uh, the ability to fail. So as humans, we're not perfect, and I think that's what makes us interesting. Um, so our failures ne necessitate improvisation um, because we fail often, and so we have to improvise, and that's where we make our creative breakthroughs, and that's what makes us creative creatures, is, is that we're, we're not we don't always do what we set out to do, and sometimes we end up with something better. So, um, so, oh, so here's a basketball analogy for sports people. I'm actually not a huge sports guy, but I thought that uh, sports are always good for analogies. So this one's for you, Maddie. I know you're a sports guy. Um, 
whenever Donovan Mitchell goes to, goes to the hoop, there's a chance that he'll miss, right? So, and that percentage changes from night to night, depending like what he ate, is he injured, et cetera. Um, and his possibility of complete failure is what keeps you glued to the TV because you never know what the outcome is going to be. Um, so take that, um, and on the other hand, check out this, this robot. This is Q, a robot made by Toyota that um, can shoot using AI with near perfect accuracy. I think like it took 20,000 shots and missed like two. And so uh, it's pretty cool, right? But are you gonna watch this for two hours? a couple times a week or for a whole season or be a fan of it your whole life? No, because it's not interesting. So, um, you know, I think that instead of seeing it as a, a competition like, oh, that robot's clearly better because he makes more shots, it's like, no, robots and AI are good at some things and humans are good at some things. Um, so instead of a competition, maybe we can look at it of like playing to each other's strengths, right? And I think that that's the best way for us as designers to look at AI. Um, and so cue the cheesy stock photo. Um, pretty happy about that. So, so the task for us as UX designers when we're working with machine learning and AI, which I believe will probably happen to all of you in your career as it becomes more and more uh, integral to a lot of software products, um, is for us to find find this this happy place. Um, so here here are the emotions that kind of our users might come to. They hear you know, at least for us at Chatbooks, our main customer is millennial moms. Um, and that's kind of who we focus. Although we have lots of different people that use the app, and a lot of them in uh, user research when we are like, hey, this is our cool new AI thing. They're like, eh, like it does it for me. I don't like that. Um, I just you know I don't trust it. And so there's this feeling of, of distrust that's been spawned by like these dystopian sci-fi flicks and um, news articles that we see. And like freaky stuff like this, like come on, Boston Dynamics, like why did you design these so scary? Um, like this is not helping, right? And so, and he lets the other one through, oh man. It gets me every time, it's like the velociraptors in Jurassic Park, basically. <laughs> like, why would we want to make that? I guess we did, though. So, um, and then, so let's add fear to our list of, of negative emotions. But as UX designers, we design experiences, and the building blocks of experiences are moments of emotion, of hopefully of positive emotion. Um, and so we want to turn distrust to trust and uh, fear into enjoyment. How do we do that? The first key point that I've learned is um, Make sure that if you're adding an AI feature to a product that it's solving a problem and that it's the right problem uh, for your users. So um, this guy is super smart. This is Andrew Moore. He's the head of, of Google Cloud AI. And his whole thing is like AI is not magic dust. You can't just throw AI on something and make it cool or good. So um, I'll just read that real quick while people are still filing in. Um, there are a couple mistakes I see being made over and over again. When people come and say, I've got this massive amount of data, surely there's some value I can get out of it. I sit them down and have a strong talk with them. What you really need to be doing is working with a problem your customers have or your workers have. Just write down the solution you'd like to have, then work backwards and figure out what kind of automation might support this goal. Then work back to whether there's d the data you need and how you collect it. So a lot of companies say, hey, we have all this data about our users. Um, let's make some cool machine learning thing that does something. But really you need to have a, a good problem that, that needs to be solved and then work towards getting that correct data. So um, let's look at a couple tas sample tasks for AI um, and determine whether they're good or bad. So this is, I want to make an app that determines the best artwork ever. Um, is this a good or bad example? Uh, I think bad because, check out the animation. Um, it's way too subjective, right? Like, um, there's a lot of gray area, everyone has a different opinion on what's beautiful, and even with some data about me, um, you wouldn't be able to read my mind and predict like the most beautiful thing of, piece of work of art that I've ever seen. So, um, speaking practically here in 2019 and not in like some sci-fi universe, what's a good task for, for AI? Only show me photos that contain a palm tree. 
So to me, this is like a good task for a few reasons. It's well defined, it's clear cut. There's a true or false answer, or like there's a way to know if it's working, you can tell. Um, because the photo either has a palm tree or it doesn't. So, um, and with the right training, it can come close in, with today's technology to perfect accurate, near perfect accuracy. So, um, let's jump into some of my experience over the past year um, at Chatbooks, designing for, a, a, we wanted to add a new AI feature. So, um, for you who, probably a good amount of you that aren't familiar with Chatbooks, um, our first big like breakaway product was the Instagram book series. So what you could do is connect to your Instagram feed, and you still can. Um, connect to your Instagram feed, and then every 60 photos you post, boom, we ship you a book of those photos with captions, and uh, people loved it. So that worked really well for us for a while, and then um, trends change, and people are posting, posting less on Instagram and social media in general. So people are printing less books at Chatbooks. So we thought, well, hey, people didn't stop taking photos. They just stopped posting them to Instagram. Um, and so we thought, OK, so here's our problem. We want to keep creating automatic photo books for people directly from their phone's photo library. Um, and so we started building what we call Roxy. Um, this is Roxy. So Roxy is a French, Frenchie, French bulldog. Um, owned by the, the owners of Chatbooks, Nate and Vanessa Quigley, often trotting around the office and like making weird noises and snorting and stuff. Um, Roxy is also the internal code name for our photo curation machine learning algorithm. So really quick, I want to go on, off on a tangent that we went off at Chatbooks and, and kind of air some of my grievances about um, anthropomorphism, anthropomorphism. I had to practice that word like five times. I still did. I still biffed it hard. Um, so let's talk about this word. Anth to anthropomorphize something means to make it seem human or human-like. Um, and it's really tempting for a lot of people and designers to say, "Hey, we're launching this AI product. Let's give it a personality and make it like your friend, right? So that people like it and it seems super smart." Um, but I think this is a bad idea in most cases. And to me, it's like a weird form of skeuomorphism, right? So like saying, oh, people are comf comfortable talking to other people, so let's make this software a person, is the same way as saying, oh, people are comfortable writing on a, a, with a pen and paper, so let's make our notes app look like a legal pad, which, as we all know, is like <laughs> bad, right? And so we need to step, go one step beyond that and realize um, we don't need to like mimic these real world interactions as much as we just need to help people get a task done in the most efficient software based way possible. A digital version doesn't have to match the, uh, the physical version. So, um, yeah, this guy, right? Um, we did, so in the end we decided not to make the app have this little Roxy dog that sorts your photos and is like, I'm sorting your photos, woof. It's like uh, too much like Clippy, right? Um, I know that Clippy gets a lot of hate, and I just want to say I actually like Clippy because he kept me entertained in my seventh grade typing class, <laughs> like figuring out all his different animations. So I love Clippy, I just didn't want to put him in the Chatbooks app. So, um, and then my final gripe about anthropomorphization is uh, with voice interfaces. Um, like Siri, I think they try to make her too, like they try too hard to make her seem like a person like, okay, I just want to set a timer and she's like, oh, just remember a washed iPhone never boils. It's like, shut up with the jokes, like the same jokes <laughs> over and over. You're not a person, stop acting like it. And so personally, I prefer like Google Assistant that's just like set a timer and it's like timer set. And I'm like, great, that's our relationship. Um, <laughs> and don't try and be something you're not because that's not what I as the user care about or want. It's you trying to like do a weird flex with your AI technology. So. Uh, let's get back to Chatbooks and Roxy, which by the way, we don't call it Roxy anymore, it's called Auto Assist because it's just a feature, it's not a, a friendly cartoon dog. So the basic way that, um, that we do it is we take all your photos and we run it through our, our machine learning model that we built and we get two things, a print score, which is like based on user behavior in the past, how likely is this photo to have been printed? based on a few different things and vectors which are like objects that are in the photo. 
we mix those all together and so our first pass at doing this was okay we have all this cool data let's just like freaking skip all the steps and make books for people like hey look we made you all these books and they're so good because we're so smart and uh, anyway um, this whole like AI task of picking someone's favorite photos for them was remember those examples it's like kind of bad like too subjective we I can't ever know what your like favorite photo is it could be this really bad ugly photo but it means so much to you whereas my algorithm says it's like a point two on the goodness scale so um, the algorithm could do a lot of cool things but the experience that we wrapped it in was um, taking way too much control away from the user and trying to read their minds which AI can't do <clears throat> so the result we got was uh, some bad reviews like app is confusing um, you're terrible liars and thieves and you're the worst people in the world because you made automatic books for me and uh, I used to love chat books and now auto selects pictures and I hate it is like you know we had gone too far so we needed to to walk it back a little <clears throat> So that brings me to my next point, which is when you're building a, an AI experience, you should look for ways to assist the user without replacing the user. Um, and we used this, this idea of like, there are going to be self-driving cars, but before we get to self-driving cars, there need to be just cars that are smart in some ways. And so like, you know, lane assist, like smart cruise control, and like automatic safety braking features, these are things that are like a comfortable uh, thing for people right now and a way to build trust towards you know maybe an autonomous future but right now in the world that we actually live in uh, people need they still want to hold a wheel they still want to have like a brake pedal just in case the computer isn't so smart sometimes so this analogy of driver assist instead of autonomous like self-driving helped us get back on the right path um, and so it led to something that I call joyful human tasks so uh, there are two kinds of tasks that I saw like users doing in chat books um, and some are like chores uh, you need to put your shipping address in uh, you need to try to remember your Instagram password like these are um, like the painful tasks that if we ever find a way to get rid of those tasks we'll do it in a heartbeat and then there's joyful human tasks um, combing through your old photos reliving those memories and like handpicking the ones that you want in your special book that you're like your Dave giving it to grandma, that's actually a, a joyful, happy moment for the user. And by um, automating that away from the user, we actually took away some of their delight of using chat books because people like going through their photos. And we were saying, no, that's work, so we're gonna do it for you. But it was actually a joyful task. So um, not all work is bad. And automatic isn't always easier because there's a large cognitive load you put on someone when you take away all the control. Um, they begin to worry about in user research they begin to worry about things like oh what is it doing to my photos am I gonna lose some photos um, is this gonna like they just didn't know what it was gonna do because we took away too much control and so it actually was less easy even though we were trying to make it easier because this huge cognitive load of like oh what are all the possible outcomes of the situation was then like foisted on the user so uh, again we want to assist and not replace the user and so look for ways to streamline their workflow and minimize without uh, replacing and without taking away the things that they actually love to do in your product. Uh, for example, I have a nest at my house um, and it's great, but it tries to use AI to learn my habits and like our schedule is pretty crazy at my house. And so um, it was never quite right. It was like always a temper, like a degree off, too cold or too hot. And it built this crazy thing for me and uh, when I looked at it, I was like, what? No. Like, and so I actually turned off this feature and I just set it manually now from my phone, which is still nice. Like I can set it from wherever, but it tried to be so smart and like do things for me that it actually created more work for me as the user because I had to go in and like delete all of these one by one and it was a huge pain. So um, <clears throat> the, next, the next thing that we learned at Chatbooks is when adding AI to your product, don't build from the top down saying, okay, what's everything we can throw at the user? Build from the bottom up, um, step by step. So you start with zero uh, at zero, which is zero AI features in your app. 
and then determine like one small thing you can do really well and add those things a step at a time. So f for us, some of those things were, okay, we can detect and hide screenshots really well. Let's add that. Uh, we can detect and hide these like completely unusable photos that are so dark and blurry that they're like they don't look like anything. We can hide those. And we can find very similar photos and combine them into a group so that you don't have to see like because everyone takes 20 photos of their dog like boom, 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 boom. And so, but you only need one in your book. So we worked from the bottom up and decided um, to, to build things that way and recontextualize our um, auto assist as something that's like totally opt in. Like here's the path of making a book in chat books and we're gonna show you things you could do along the way using AI, but we're never gonna force you to use AI. Um, so let the, choose, let the user choose when and how they want to use those AI features and let them uh, let them undo or opt out. So um, now for like the good stuff, right? This is this is the what we ended up building after all of that user research and coming back to the problem and and rethinking it. Um, and so this is the kind of the photo book creation flow as it stands. Like I filmed this last, I recorded it last night on my phone. So I'll walk through it as we as we play it here. So you create a photo book, uh, choose your size and, and start. We show them some albums that they created um, if they want or they can just hit camera roll. And we give them some book types. Travel's really popular. So if you hit travel, you can just choose the date yourself or it looks for trips for you using smart stuff and you can pick a trip. So I picked a trip that it suggested for me and we explain, okay, this is all we're doing and let people opt out at that point. And it shows, okay, we hid five photos. And it does a pretty good job. Like, these are screenshots. I don't want them in my book. Um, but we let people include them back in if they want. So there's that way of undoing what we did. And then, um, this is my beautiful wife. And so there's the similar photo groups. We let them pick. We say, okay, these are similar, but again, we're not going to pick for you, which we used to do. Um, and we let people, you know, they get the joyful task of going through these memories and picking what goes in the book. And then, uh, yeah, and then you've got a book uh, started. So uh, it's a really slick process and actually kind of walking back, like I said, our AI features made it easier for people. Like we almost do a little less for them than we used to, but people can do it faster because we're not uh, stepping on their toes. So uh, a quick summary of like my rules um, over this past year and um, yeah, the things we've talked about. So, one, make sure you're solving the right problems. Um, those problems should be clear cut, well defined, and objective so that a computer can do them. Um, <coughs> be careful with anthropomorphism. It might work in some contexts. I'm not saying that you can never use it, like if you're making something for kids or something that it truly makes sense. But again, I f personally find it really grating when an app tries to be my friend. Um, assist and don't replace the user. We talked about that a lot. Um, use AI to streamline the workflow and take away the noise so the user can focus on the things they love to do, the joyful human tasks. Um, automatic isn't always easier and AI can't read minds. So make sure that you're not hiding too much behind the curtain so that people get lost. Um, work from the bottom up when adding features. That's just the idea of Find one thing you can do well and build on that a step at a time um, instead of throwing like all the spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks. And then let the user opt in or conversely opt out of, of AI features in your product. So uh, again, those are my rules. I'm sure there's more and when we do Q&A in a couple minutes, maybe you can tell me some things you've learned if any of you have some insights for me. Um, and so I wanted to take those rules real quick and look at a couple AI products that are out there in the world and see if we can kind of score them on the rubric and see how they do. So um, this first app is called Quartz. It's a, like a chatbot app that gets you the news and it's supposed to kind of learn your preferences over time. And so I was really excited to try it out. I tried it out like I think a year ago. So I don't know if it's changed, but um, <coughs> Basically, you like talk to the app, right? Like you're texting your buddy about the news. And 
I, at first it was really cool and I was like, okay, yeah, cool, sounds good, man. And like, um, it would tell you, hey, this is what happened today. And it like forces you to respond like, oh, yeah, emojis, I guess. And like, those are cool. Um, but actually using this app feels kind of like a chore. So a couple rules um, they're breaking is the, they're trying to make the app seem like it's your friend. It's trying to be like a person. Um, and they're actually creating, instead of assisting the user, they're creating more work for you and putting these like barriers in the way that don't really make sense. So um, I basically couldn't tell what problem it was trying to solve. Uh, I think it was just more like, hey, we have cool technology. Let's like package it this way. So um, in the end, I found it a lot easier just to read an article like from beginning to end instead of trying to interact with this thing because it wasn't making my task of catching up on the news easier. It was just trying to wow me with cool features and actually getting in my way. So to me, that one is like, no, it didn't win. Uh, this is one that is um, kind of controversial. Uh, <clears throat> Gmail smart replies, right? So um, it's some people have distaste for it because it's like lowering our level of communication down to these like, oh cool, sounds great. Like to the point where like someone like your like your parents will call you and be like, oh like something bad happened and you'll be like, okay cool, awesome. <laughs> thanks thanks for the email. Like is it doing that to us as people? So some people worry about that, but looking beyond that. Um, it keeps most of the rules of in incorporating AI into your product. First of all, you can go into settings and turn it off, which is like, yes, you need that. Um, <clears throat> it solves a problem, so people get a ton of email and they want to be able to reply quickly to emails that only deserve like an acknowledgement type of reply and sound somewhat human. Um, and so uh, another thing it passes is there's no little like friend that pops up like, hey, I'm the Gmail wizard and like, what do you want to say to this email? You know, so it doesn't try and be your friend. Um, and it assists the user, but allows them to, to uh, just hit reply and do it the way they used to do it. So it doesn't block them from their workflow. Um, so that's, that's an example of like, I think a well, it's not flashy or anything, but it's a well implemented version of, of machine learning. Um, this is a funny tweet that I just like. Uh, my dad told me he makes decisions now by emailing himself a potential plan and reading Gmail's suggested auto responses to determine if it's a good idea. <laughs> if it says that's a plan, you know you're on to something. So unintended uh, bonuses, bonus features. Um, okay, so wrapping up. Um, at the beginning I said man versus machine. Now I'm saying man plus machine. Um, Pretty obvious, I think, what that, that means. But some of you might think I'm overly positive about like AI, the future of AI, that it's not going to kill us all. Um, that's just my opinion. And, and I also like think it's really interesting to read about all the possible outcomes of AI. Um, but I choose to focus on like a future of AI and human cooperation and build towards that future, because the future isn't designed yet. Um, and we're designers, right? So. <clears throat> We get to do that. So uh, I look forward to seeing, you know, over the years, as us as a Utah design community, what cool experiences we build with AI and how we create this cooperation mindset with AI features. So um, yeah, that's it. Thanks for your time. And uh, you can clap now. Yeah.